Welcome to C1. We're so excited you guys are here and we want to say welcome to everybody who's watching with us online. Whether you're watching this evening, tomorrow, or a year from now, we're excited that you're with us. We also want to encourage you to like, share, and subscribe. If this message speaks to you or if you have someone that you'd like to send it to, feel free to engage with us on social media and on the internet and help us um, spread the message and get people involved. And if you are a guest with us this morning, we just want to say thank you so much for being here at C1. We are so glad that you're here worshiping with us. And there are Connect cards in front of you. If you could go ahead and grab one of those and um, you can fill it out at your convenience. You can also fill out a Connect card online as well. If you were like, oh, I don't have time to do it, you can go and jump on our website and fill it out there. And we will contact you and we would love to get to know you, answer any questions that you may have about our church but after you get done you can also give it to one of the staff members or you can put it back at our offering boxes if you just go right out these doors and it, right before you exit there's a little gray box and it's off to your right and you can place it there and we just are so thankful for your continuing giving thank you guys so much for being being faithful and giving and there's a few ways you can give you can give in person which is right here and dropping it back and the um, offering box as you're going out the doors where you put the connect card and there is also you can give online and then there is also texting you can text 84321 and your amount and say if you want it to go to um, our missions you can put the missions in there and the amount and that would be an awesome way for you to give and it's very easy and very convenient sometimes I do it while I'm in the kitchen making dinner or you know something like that where I'm like oh I need to give and so it's very convenient and very easy we also want to remind you, if you made a faith promise to give to missions, um, we just want to remind you to continue to be faithful with your faith promises and continue to help us support the missionaries, both local and abroad. Yes, thank you guys so much for all that you do. We are going to pray, and we are just going to invite the Lord here today because he is here. He wants to speak to us. He wants to, to minister to us. He wants to tell us that he loves us each and every way that, that he can think imaginable possible. He wants to speak to you today. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are so, so good. Lord, we thank you that you are here today. God, we thank you that you are about to speak into our lives, that you are about to speak directly to us. Lord, I pray right now, if there's anybody here that is questioning whether God loves them, Lord, you will show up so tremendously to where their heart will explode with just expectation and knowledge, knowing that you, God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one that created everything, loves them and puts them first. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for being here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and worship. There were walls between us. By the cross you came and broke them down, and broke them down. And there were chains around us. By your grace we are no longer bound, no longer bound. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light. You call my name, then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger. Your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Feel the darkness. Fear the darkness shaking. All the dead are coming back to life. I'm back to life. I hear the song awaken. All creation singing, we're alive. Cause you're alive. You call me out of the grave, you call me into the light, you call my name, then my heart came alive. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Your love is greater, your love is stronger, your love awakens, awakens, awakens me. Shout 
that one more time, Lord, praise. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise, oh Lord, oh Lord our God. Oh, oh Lord, oh Lord our God. Oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord our God.
the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. Father, you're so good. Father, we just thank you that you sent your son to this world to die a death that we deserve, to live a life we can never live, to, to make a way that was unavailable. We thank you, God, for what you did. Lord, we... Throughout history, humans have been trying to get to you, but it was for nothing. We can't get to you. So God, you stepped into humanity to get to us. And we thank you, Jesus, for what you did. Let's, let's, let's just take a moment. Let's just, let's just be quiet before the Lord. And let's just see what he's going to say. Let's just take a moment to listen about to sound crazy and I'm okay with that but I can't help but feel in my spirit that someone here needs to rebuke death off of their life I, I know that sounds so crazy but what I what I believe is happening is there's someone so attacked spiritually that they believe the only answer is death that they're to a hopeless point in their life no hope whatsoever and they came here as a last stitch effort to find hope and let me tell you there's hope in Jesus Christ the situation that's attacking you right now is not hopeless. It is not hopeless. When Jesus came and died to give hope to the hopeless, to give power to the powerless, to give life to the lifeless, it's not hopeless. So I'm gonna pray. I'm just gonna rebuke that spirit, that mindset off of people because I believe that we need to have the right mindset before we launch into the word. Father, I just come before you today thanking you. I rebuke this death. I, I, I rebuke in the mighty name of Jesus this, this mindset that there is no hope. Lord, I pray for the people that seem hopeless, that seem that, that, that life can't turn around right now. I pray right now for life to intervene through your spirit, Jesus that you will quicken our hearts and our minds to receive from you and change our perspective on what we're facing right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Death, you have no sting. You have no victory. You have no part here. I just release life through the life-giving spirit of the Holy Spirit right now to every heart that will receive. I thank you, Jesus, for what you've already done in our hearts, the groundwork that you've laid through worship and song. And I thank you, Father, for what you're about to do in our hearts through worship in your word. So Lord, as we transition to worship in your word, I pray that you will open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds to 
receive it. That, that, that we don't just hear it and it goes out the other ear, but that we chew on it. That, it, that, that you open us up and do heart surgery to the hopeless, let them walk out with hope. To the depressed, let them walk out with joy. To the anxious, let them walk out with peace. To, to the ones struggling with addiction, let them walk out with freedom. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. It's a good day, is it not? The sun's shining. Whether the sun's shining or not, it's a good day to be in the house of God. And the reason why it's a good day to be in the house of God is... We get to celebrate Jesus together, right? Here at C1, we celebrate Jesus, we live in community, we share our story, and we make a difference. And, man, I am so stoked. I, I get excited. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine. He's actually preaching in Propler Bluff this morning. Um, he's talking to his church about um, loving your neighbor. And uh, we're, we've been talking this whole week, and I got to pray with him this morning. And there is this, this anticipation in both of our prayers and this this excitement about what God's going to do today. And let me tell you, God's already done something, and I think he's going to do something more. We're continuing in our series in the book of James. It's a series we titled How To, because James is the how-to book in the Bible. It's the practical. It's not heavy on doctrine. It's heavy on practicality. It wants us to have a practical practical way of living out the Christian walk. And we're going to continue in chapter 1. We're going to be wrapping up chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 19 through 27. And to give you context, that James is a book that gets down to business, okay? I want, I want us to understand that. He doesn't waste time. There are 108 verses in the entire book of James. 108 dispersed throughout the chapters. Out of the 108 verses, there are 54 imperative verses. Now, an imperative sentence, for all of us who have forgotten, that is a command. An imperative is a command. And if you count the hypotheticals that James lays out, there are four more imperative sentences within the book of James. So, anywhere from 108 to you know, four more, 112, or, or 54 to, to 60. So James is about giving commands. He's saying, don't do this, do this. Consider it pure joy. He's not like, hey, if you feel like it, maybe you should think about this. He's like, no, you consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. That is the proper response to trials of many kinds as a believer. We have two choices. We can either consider it pure joy or we can consider it pure joy. That is the command given to us through the gospel, uh, or not the gospel, the epistle of James. So there are 54 imperatives here. And today we're probably going to be hitting on one that strikes a chord with probably a lot of people, myself included. Why? Why? is because we all like to talk. Whether you admit it or not, how many of you guys talk to yourselves? Yeah. Okay. So there's only like two sane people in the entire room. <laughs> I'm just playing. Um, but we're going to launch into this. And James, he's writing to the church... Uh, um, scattered throughout the Roman world, and he's, he's telling them some really important commands to walk out this Christian walk, and he starts in verse 19 with this. And this is following, consider it pure joy to face trials. Um, if you need wisdom, ask, but ask with the right heart, serving God only. Then he says, blessed is he who endures temptation and trial. And then he wraps up chapter 1, with 
this thought. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word of God, or humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. That word that God's planted in their hearts is the gospel of Jesus Christ. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says um, for, for those, be, be ye doers of the word. Don't just listen only. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself and walk away and forget what you look like. Some mornings I wish I could do that. Um, but that's what James says. If we hear the perfect word of God and we walk away and don't do what it says, it, 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 it sounds completely crazy. He's like, why would you do that? Like, this is the only word that can give life. It's the only word that can save your, uh, your soul. But if you look carefully into the perfect law, that would be the gospel, that sets you free. And if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. And then he launches into this beautiful thing to wrap up this, this um, it's almost like the crescendo. If you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of the Father means caring for the orphan and the widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. So, when I was looking at this this week, I, I kind of saw, the way I saw it was kind of like a ladder. There were steps to what he was getting at. It, it was building on top of building. And um, now I, I'm no architect or anything like that, but there's a foundation here. And any, any home, like one of the things that you want to inspect is the foundation, correct? Because if it has a bad foundation, the home might fall apart. Even though it might have the most beautiful kitchen, it might have the biggest master bathroom with the jacuzzi tub, everyone's like, well, we could deal with the foundation later. That's what, no. Um, it might have the uh, most amazing features, but if the foundation's bad, there. That, that is a, a sign of a bad home. And uh, there's a foundation that James leads in this, I would say, crescendo of, of a cause and effect or uh, in this, you know, very few short verses that he, he wraps up chapter one with. And the first, the foundation for the last two he launches with is quick to listen. So I'm going to give you guys two thoughts to chew on this week. It's the two how-tos for this week. And the first how-to is how to listen and accept. How to listen and accept. So often I think that we read that verse is quick to speak, quick to become angry, and slow to listen. Like even though it says quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, we, we flip it on its head because it's easier to do that. And there's a difference between listening and hearing, and how we listen matters. James is saying just quick to listen and slow to speak, and I think sometimes we, we might get the listen part down, but the whole time we're listening, our wills are turning, and instead of actually just listening to listen, to hear the person out, we're listening to respond, and there's a difference. There's a difference. One, when you're listening to listen, when someone's just having a bad day and just they just need someone to talk to and, and really listening to listen, that's really a form of love. Like, man, just come on, let's, let's just hear it out. What's going on? But listening to respond, that's kind of 
combative. Now, the Holy Spirit might give you something to say to that person. I'm not saying don't have a conversation, but there's a difference between listening to listen and listening to respond. And James is saying, listen to listen. Be quick to listen. That should be our reaction before we blurt out. Before we blurt out. And I'm going to fib on myself. Not fib. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell, uh, tell a story on myself, and I'm going to wrap myself out for a second. So um, Thursday afternoon, I decided my, my daughter has been begging to go to the zoo. So I knew that I was going to be here Friday morning. And Saturday morning, I was like, you know what? Let's just take Thursday afternoon, and let's take Skye to the zoo. It might be our last day with her away from school because she had school Wednesday she had school Friday and that was a whole different issue of emotions for me uh Amy held it together I was like <laughs> how is she this big you know but I didn't cry I, I think I had some water and allergies and stuff in my eyes but um the pollen was real high this week but um we went to the zoo and I got there and I was tired I was like, I'm going to get some coffee. And I went to their little cafe in the zoo. And at the Nashville Zoo right now, if you're 13 and over, you have to wear a mask. So I had my, my mask on. But a drink and a mask don't mesh. They, they're, they're, one has to go. And, well, I'm not about to waste coffee. I could live without a mask. Um, I pulled my mask down, I'm drinking, I'm drinking it, I'm drinking it, and uh, a zoo attendant told me to put my mask back up, and I'm about to, I'm about to get on a carousel with Sky and everything, and in the past, I've always brought my water on the carousel and stuff, I, I didn't think anything of it, so he's like, hey, put the, the mask back up, and I didn't even let him finish, I was not quick to listen. I was quick to respond. And, um, and the anger I had wasn't the type of anger that the Lord wants. And I was actually wearing my C1 shirt too. So um, I, didn't, I didn't, but I was irritated. I was like, then don't sell drinks inside the zoo, dude. And he's like, you can't have a drink on the ride anyways. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, and Amy gave me that look that only the Holy Spirit can give through a wife. And I was like, God, forgive me. Um, I've sinned. I was, ironically, I've already wrote my message about quick to listen, slow to speak. And my first response was, this is stupid. And I'm giving you an example of what not to do. But we so often do that. We hear something we don't like instead of taking and even giving the person a chance to um, finish, we just jump in and we say, and it's not just that we do that to people, we do that to God. And if you really want to ruin your life, I will give you a formula. Don't listen to God. It's pretty simple because God... He says in Jeremiah 29, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. Well, how are you going to know those plans? You got to listen, yeah. And so James is giving this, this uh, formula to listen. And I think that if we're, we're quick to speak, if we're quick to speak, what will end up doing is we'll end up interjecting what we think God is saying to us. And it's a dangerous place to be because if we think, okay, I think God would want me to do this. I, I've, I've had conversations with people like, well, I really, I, I have a piece about it. I'm like, God's not going to tell you to move in with your girlfriend or move in with your boyfriend. What are you thinking? That's like, you're not listening to God. You're listening to your own desires and you're putting God above it. And, and that doesn't work. You're, you're, you're putting his name on what you want to do. And if we are quick to listen, that means we, we shut our mouths. We get quiet. And we say, God, what are you saying? And a lot of times, 
how he talks to us, and let's talk about how God talks, okay, just for a moment. Because sometimes we want this audible voice. We want to hear instruction. We want to hear. And I, I think that we, we rob ourselves of God speaking to us because we don't recognize how he speaks most of the time. The number one way God speaks to his people is through this book, a compilation of books, really, called the Bible. If you want to know the heart of God, then read the Bible. Read the Bible. Consume the Word of God. Eat the Word of God. Not literally, but mentally. Just let that be. Jesus even said, talking in John chapter 4, he said that, that, that my food is to do the will of the Father. How do you know the will of the Father? You learn the Word of God. And I can't tell you how many times as I'm sitting here praying about different things and whether it be at home or whatever, how the Lord will speak to me. He won't say, hey, I need you to do this, 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 and this. A lot of times it'll be, go to Proverbs, whatever, or open to Micah 3. What, I mean, like, he'll just lay a scripture that I've read on my heart. And I'm like, I'll just say, God, no, I need you to speak to me. And he'll just like, no, 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 John 10, what, you know, like, no, God, I need you to speak to me. Go, go read John 10. So I'm, I've got to the point where, like, if I have a scripture just go through my head, a reference, I'll just go open the Bible, and I'll just read it. And, like, more often than not, I would say 95% above. It's exactly what I need to hear. Exactly what I need to hear. Whether it's something I want to hear or not, it's exactly what I need to hear. There was a time where Amy and I were arguing, and um, I was so mad. And this is years ago, but I just remember, it was like our first big fight as a couple after we got married. And I was like, this is not how marriage is supposed to be. She's supposed to submit to me. And I'm like, you know, I, was like, I didn't understand submission at the time. Um, what, I, I didn't really study that out, um, but it also says husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church, and I was not doing that by any means, and um, I wanted her to pull her weight, and I didn't want to pull my own, but I was just really irritated, and I, I did not want to apologize. I will not apologize because I am right, and then the Lord led me to, um, I think it's First Peter, humble yourself under God's mighty right hand, and he will lift you up in honor. And I'm like, I, but God, no. I'm like, ah. And so I went in there. I said, Ames, I was wrong. And I wanted to say, even though I'm right. Um, like, I didn't, I don't even remember what we were arguing over. Probably something stupid like the toothpaste, um, you know, some, something dumb. But um, it, might, it might have been just a toilet seat. It was one of those dumb arguments early on in marriage. Um, but I just remember the Lord leading me to humility. And it was what I needed to hear. It's not what I wanted to hear. And, um, well, just FYI how it worked out. We're still married. We're still in love with each other. Praise God. Well, I mean, I'm in love with her. I can't speak for her <laughs> on, on her half. But I think sometimes we got to recognize how God speaks if we want to listen to God speaking, that he speaks through his word the majority of the time. Another way God speaks, he speaks through people. He speaks through people. And obviously, this when, when people will give you a word from the Lord, I, I think that uh, we, we need to have discernment to, to know whether that's God or not. On our end, be, and, and the Bible says don't treat any prophecy with contempt, so we just need to run it through, okay, does this conflict with Scripture? Is what he's saying really apply to me? Is like, And the Holy Spirit's really good about giving you peace when people speak to you. Um, but he speaks to us through people. And, and sometimes it might not be like one of those really spiritually heavy moments and the guy walks up to you or the girl walks up to you and says, this is what I really feel in my heart and just lays it out and reads your mail. It might just be one of those things that you're having in a passing conversation that you're wrestling with and then someone just says something to you not even knowing 
and then suddenly like, wow, that's what I needed to hear, but the Holy Spirit will speak through people. For example, Ben and I, when, when last summer, and he probably doesn't even remember this conversation, but we were talking about the will of God and some of our conversations, they, they just get deep. And if you ever want to have a just amazingly deep conversation, this is the guy for you because he's amazing. He's smart, and, but he's like, where is this going? Oh, no. <laughs> no, but Ben, he, he quoted, I think, uh, his former lead pastor, and it was something, though, that I needed to hear at that moment and it wasn't even like, I wasn't looking for a word, but he said, so often, his former lead pastor said to him, and he said to me, so often God won't give you a hard yes, but he'll give you a hard no. And I was like, whoa, that was a word of God for me. And I'm still like that. He said that once in a conversation, and I still remember it to this day. The Lord's just resonated that in my heart, because as we're trying to discern the will of God, Often God will say, no, don't do that to keep us in his will. But then he also gives us wisdom and freedom to walk into the yeses that he puts in front of us. And it was exactly what I needed to hear. So God speaks to us mainly through his word. He speaks to us through his people. And then he also speaks to us in prayer. He does speak to us in prayer. And there are times when we get quiet before the Lord. Those times where he lays a scripture on your heart, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you, putting you in your head. And, and sometimes we think that there is this, there's just a certain voice that comes with God. That somehow we get it in, probably because of Hollywood or something like that, and they always have this booming, thundering voice that's associated with the voice of God. I would argue, don't, don't put those expectations on God. Let him be God. Um, he'll speak to you how you can receive it. That, that's what I find. But he'll speak to you. Um, I, I, I could probably count on one hand, may, maybe actually with on two fingers, I, I truly believe I've heard the audible voice of God. And there's no other explanation for it. Um, but he does speak. Some people go their whole lives without hearing it. One would be when I was called into ministry. I was at an altar. No one was around me. I was crying. And the Lord said, I want you to be my missionary. And I, I just remember hearing that popping up going, who said that? Like, I heard it. And then uh, when, when we were about to take this church, I remember hearing something. And I was almost asleep. And I popped up. And it scared me. And I thought, who said that? Amy's dead asleep. And this is back in Missouri. I'm like, oh, I need to pray. <laughs> like, it scared me because it was like what, what I felt like the Lord wanted to do. And this is before, um, this is just after the first interview. Or well, maybe I was getting ahead of myself, but I felt like the Lord was laying some stuff on my heart. And he, I was, I was, last thing on my mind was, was you guys, honestly. I was thinking, I want to sleep. At the time, we had a less than a year old and a two and a half year old. And um, just sleep is precious when you have ch children that small. And the Lord just spoke that. And I thought, whoa. And no one else heard it but me. But we got to be quick to listen. And here's the problem. If we're always interjecting to God, you can't hear him. Uh, Amy and I, we were talking um, this week, and I said it would be really funny to do an illustration where um, you come up with the mic and you just start talking with me, and like I ask you a question, hey, where do you want to go to eat? And then when she starts to respond, I say, oh, yeah, you're right, Popeyes. And then, hey, Ames, what do you want to do this afternoon? Oh, no, you're good. Yeah, hiking, that's right. That's what you want to do. And... Um, she's like, I don't want to do that. That's too staged and that would be stupid. Um, so, but I'm like, well, it would have got the idea across. Thanks for building me up. Um, so I did it anyways and I probably looked stupid. Um, so proving her right. But so often that's what we do. God, what do you want me to do? Oh, you're right. You want me to do this. 
God, how do you want me to, re- oh, you're right, you want me. And if we are quick to speak, slow to listen, suddenly we start putting words in God's mouth. And that's a dangerous place to be. Because, number one, we're assuming that we know the mind of God. In Romans eleven thirty three through 36, I just want to read this real quick. But it says, Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. So Paul establishes something very needed when we're talking about listening to God. God knows and we don't. And if we're quick to respond, if, we're, if we don't know how to settle our heart enough to listen to the voice of God, or listen at least for the voice of God, because sometimes there will be seasons in your life where it will seem like he's being silent, and he's not being silent, he's working. And that, those are the moments where we just got to trust his will and press into him harder and more fervently and it, we'll, we'll, we'll discover in those seasons, it's not that he ever stopped speaking, we quit listening. Or we didn't want to hear what he was saying. And so often, I think that's the case. And if we're not quick to listen, but we're quick to speak, we'll start putting words in God's mouth. And that's a dangerous place to be, because it, how impossible is it for us to understand his decisions and his ways? It's It's... It's an effort in lunacy. It's complete and absolute um, stupidity to try for us to try to figure out what he's going to do. To say, God, this is what you want me to do without even consulting him or listening to him. So James is trying to establish something here. He's trying to say, listen first and listen well and listen long. And then he says, on top of that, accept. So it's not enough to listen for God or to listen well, listen first and listen long. It's not, that's not enough. You must accept, not just listen, but accept. So that takes it a step further. I told you this kind of like the base, and then we're going to build like a ladder and, 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 or, or a foundation So he wants us to accept the word that God has placed in us. How do we accept the word that God's placed in us? Well, he's about to answer that. We do what it says. We we literally, when we accept the word that God placed in us, we lay down our own preferences. We push them aside. And he he actually gives us a a little bit of a, a prerequisite to accept God's word first. He says, get rid of all moral felt, filth and evil and then humbly accept. So if there's moral filth and evil in your hearts, more than likely you're not walking in humility. But the, he's saying, get rid of that. So if you're quick to listen, slow to speak and slow to become angry. So if you're listening to God, he'll probably say, hey, you need to repent of this you need to give this to me. He'll lead you in the path of righteousness. And he's saying, get rid of this stuff. He's talking to Christians. This letter is to Christians. And, and so often, we don't want to hear that stuff. Like, hey, you need to kind of stop getting drunk on the weekends. Like, what? No, no, that can't be God, because I enjoy that. Well, no, you're going to enjoy not having a headache on Sunday and feeling like you constantly need to, you know what I'm saying? Like, okay, so... We, we get rid of moral filth. We, it's that, it's that, that's sanctification. It's not that we'll ever be sinless. It's the fact that we sin less and less over time through the work of the Holy Spirit in us. 
We can't walk this life out without the work of the Holy Spirit in us. In fact, the only way we can hear the word of God and resonate in us is through the work of the Holy Spirit. When we're reading the Bible, the Bible is the only book that can change a life, but it's also the only book where the the author meets with you while you're reading it. The Holy Spirit works on you through the word and he 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 helps us to accept it. So he he as we're reading the word, like for instance, as I'm reading the word, I'm reading stuff about like um there's there's a scripture where it talks about husbands be fair and treat your I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but treat your um, wives well, love your wives well, so your prayers won't be hindered. I was like, dude, what? Like, not that I treat my wife badly. I'm not trying to paint a picture, and I'm a horrible husband. But if I want my if I want my my prayers to be effective, I gotta love her the way God wants me to love her and treat her the way God wants me to treat her. And and so that came alive in me. Like, how can I treat my wife better? Because I want God to hear my prayers. You know, like um, that might be a selfish reason to treat my wife, but that's what the Bible says. So your prayers will not be hindered. And and so it, the 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 Holy Spirit so often reveals things in our life that we need to work on as we read his word. He helps us get rid of evil. He helps us to get rid of moral filth. And then as we do that, that shows humility so we can humbly accept the word of God in us. And I think there's a lot of Christians today that have not accepted salvation. What do you mean? They're constantly condemning themselves because they don't understand how good salvation is. Because they truly, they're having a humble, they're, they're having an issue with this humbly accepting. Just accept it. You're saved by grace so that no man can boast. That's what the Bible says. That's just the fact of your salvation. You can't earn it. You can't do anything about it. It's God. You didn't play any part in this. So we have to listen and accept And the last thought I want to leave you with is how to do with the right posture. James builds on this, not only is it enough to listen. He's like, it's not enough to listen. It's not enough to accept. You have to do what it says. It's lunacy to take and to hear the word of God and then not do what it says, especially if we claim to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. It does not make sense. It does not compute. And that's what James is getting at. If you heard the gospel, if you heard the great commandment, if you are letting the Holy Spirit transform you, then do what he says. Just do what, you have to live it out. That's really proof that the, Holy, the, that, that the Holy Spirit's working on you. It's the life we live. And, you know, the, the, the sinner's prayer, I don't, like just to give you an example, like the sinner's prayer wasn't around 100 years ago. An evangelist made this up to, as he was doing tent revivals and different things like that. He came up with this prayer that kind of walks through what what salvation looks like. So we... We confess with the mouth, believe in our heart. So uh, we've said it here together, the sinner's prayer. And there's a lot of different variations. But God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that you were raised to life. Come be Lord of my life. You know, so like that's pretty much the gist of the sinner's prayer. But here's the thing. We have a lot of people out there that said that and their lives never transformed. The proof of your salvation isn't the fact that you said it. It's the fact that when you said it, we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart. There is this eight-inch gap between our mouth and our heart. We can say stuff all the time. People do it all the time. There's, we, we have a whole political system that people say stuff all the time, and they don't do anything about it. Because it comes out their mouth, but they don't believe it in their heart. But there's something about confess. We confess with our mouth and we believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord. And then the Holy Spirit comes into our life and he empowers us to live a holy life. Peter tells us that everything we need for this life has been given to us 
to live a holy life in Christ. And that's the Holy Spirit. But the proof of your salvation isn't the fact that you said it. It's the life that follows after you said it. It's, it's that, and that's what James is building on. He said, don't just hear it. You have to do it. And I really like how the King James and the, and the NKJV, they, they, they add this word in this translation. But it says, be ye doers of the word. And that word, be. Before you can be a doer, you have to be. And that's, that's really the gist. Be in Christ. Be filled with the Spirit. Be in your word. Be. And then, when you are, then doing the word is overflow of who you are. And so, James hits us. He hits us with, don't just hear the word, do what it says, and then he hits us with this religion. He talks about religion and the tongue, and he's gonna, we're going to get into the tongue in a later chapter, because later on in the book he says the tongue is set on fire by, by the pits of hell, so um, that's going to be fun to talk about. But he says if you claim to be religious, but you can't control your tongue, you're fooling yourselves. You, you, but really, what is James getting at? Because I want to define, I want to define what that word religion means. Because I'm, I'm not a big proponent of religion. I'm a big proponent of relationship with Jesus Christ that is lived out in our daily life. Because religion is a bunch of do's, don'ts, and it can kind of look like the law. Well, I have to get dressed up to come to church. No, I would argue that you need to get dressed to come to church. Dressed up, maybe not. You know, but like do do what you feel the Lord's leading you to do. Um, I have to do a certain thing. I, I have to read my Bible. I have to check that off my list. That that's kind of religion. So reading the Bible, praying, all these things are are tools of discipleship, of becoming more like Jesus. But when the tools of discipleship become the rules of discipleship, it's no longer discipleship. You're no longer growing in your walk with God. And so the word here for religion is defined as worship through ritual acts. But look at the ritual acts that God spells out. So if you really want to talk about the true religion that God honors, it's still worship. But what he says in here, the last verse of this great chapter he says, the pure and genuine religion, so worship the ritual acts in the sight of God, the Father, means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. So that religion has nothing to do really with you, but it's all for God's glory. And I would say that you can do the right things with the wrong motives and not be obedient. And that's what James is getting at here in the end. It's not enough. He says, you have to listen. You can't just talk. It's not enough just to listen. You have to accept. It's not enough just to accept the word of God but you have to do what it says. And it's not enough just to do what it says. You have to do it with the intent of glorifying God and not yourself. Because there are people, and this is something we all fight against, but we do things, the right things, even, even things for the church, even things for, for God, but we do them with the idea of look at me and not at God. Even though you're doing the right thing, you're doing the right thing. If you're doing the right thing with the intent of people seeing you and God's not getting the glory for it, it's the wrong thing. And, and that's what James is hitting on here. You could do the word of God. You, you, can, you could do it but if you aren't doing it right, 
with the right heart and the right posture before God, then you're doing it wrong and you shouldn't do it at all. Because when, as we serve God, as we are quick to listen, as we're quick to accept, as we're quick to do, all that's for nothing if we do it with the wrong heart. If we're doing it to look at me, look at what I've done, look at... God wants all the glory and he deserves all the glory. As we do things, that, that's why I love what he says there, the true religion that God honors is to take care of the orphan and the widow and do not be corrupted by this world. That has nothing to do about pointing back at me. That has everything to do with God's love for people. To take care of an orphan, that's love for people. To take care of a widow in their distress, that's love for people. Not to be corrupted by this world, that's love for God. So our life can bring glory to him. And today, I, I think that what I would like to do is to t really just give us an opportunity to listen. Let's ask, let's ask, God, is there anything in my life that I need to get rid of? Is there any filth and evil that I've been holding back? Is is there any unforgiveness? Are there people in this room that I need to ask forgiveness of? Are there conversations that I need to have on the way home? Do I, what, what do I need to do? He said, humbly accept the word that God's put in you. And I truly believe that we put ourselves in a posture of humility. God's gonna speak and he's gonna give us instruction how to move forward because I feel like there are people in this room that they kind of feel like they're plateaued like it's everything's going good but it's, you know it's but that, that's a dangerous place to be when we're walking with Jesus because we can get comfortable and when we get comfortable that means we don't want to step out in faith we don't want to do what the Lord says to do and that's what James says it's not enough to hear it we got to do it and we've got to do it with the right heart. And I think it starts with a quick question. God, what's in me that would keep me from listening, accepting, doing, and doing it with the right posture? And I can't tell you what that conversation is going to look like, but I can tell you that it's going to take some time of us shutting up. being quiet before the Lord. He might lead you to a scripture. He might lead you to a person. He might tell you to do something. He might tell you to come forward and pray. But when he does, do it. And do it with the right heart. And if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we we kind of alluded to this prayer that we pray to, to recognize the need for salvation. But if you're here today, you never even prayed that prayer. You never even, that's really the, the starting point for a changed life. It's, it's literally opening the door to your heart to say, Holy Spirit, come in. That's what asking for salvation is is saying, I'm not enough to get to heaven, but Jesus, you came to earth, and I'm recognizing that you paid my way there, and that you don't want me to go to hell, so I'm gonna let you be Lord of my heart and my mind. And if you never accepted Jesus' Lordship, I'm gonna be right here. My wife is gonna be right over here, and we'd love to pray with you. We'd love to introduce Jesus to you. It's so simple. God Almighty made salvation so simple. He, didn't, he could have told us, if you want to get to heaven, go climb the highest mountain in all the world and stay up there for a week and fast and pray. He could have done any of that to receive salvation. But what he did, he said, I'm going to come to you. 
You don't have to tr- climb the highest mountain. You don't have to do anything. You just have to believe that Jesus is the son of the living God and that he died for your sins and that God rose him again. And that's it. He made it so simple because he loves us. He's not slow in keeping his promises, but he's not willing that any perish, but all come to a place of repentance. So if you need to, if you need prayer, if you, if you say, well, Ryan, I've actually prayed that prayer, but I've walked away from my relationship with Jesus. I really haven't been living for him. And, and I need to, I need to repurpose my, my life into his hands. Some people would say, rededicate my life to him. If that's you, we're going to be up here to pray for you. But what I don't want to happen today is us to sit still and to harden our hearts when the Lord is speaking. To, To ignore what he's saying or to listen to the wrong voice. Because I guarantee you, if the Holy Spirit's speaking, that means fear is speaking. That means anxiety speaking. That means depression speaking. We gotta discern what voice are we gonna listen to. Know how you can tell if it's the Holy Spirit? He'll bring peace. It, it might be, it might kind of be scary at first if the Holy Spirit says, hey, you need to go talk to that person and ask forgiveness. Oh, I can't do that. I feel that tension. I don't know if I should do that. That's probably the Holy Spirit because he's asking you to step out in faith. Or he's like, man, you need to come down front and let Ryan or Amy pray with you. And he's like, oh, I don't know about that. Like, I, I feel this tension right here. I, I just, I can't, I can't do that. That's probably the Holy Spirit. Fear, what fear sounds like, fear sounds really comfortable. We think fear is scary. No, fear is, fear sounds really comfortable. Fear sounds like that lazy boy. Fear sounds like, man, your seat's already warm. You should probably stay there. Fear sounds like, no, no one knows. Um, Just raise your hands and worship and walk out the door the same way you walked in and no one will know the difference. But God doesn't want that today. He wants to work on us collectively and individually so we walk out and and we are a force to be reckoned with in this world for his kingdom. So let's stand and let's ask and let's let's listen. And if you're if you need prayer, we're gonna be down here to pray for you. Father, I pray right now that you do your work. Holy Spirit, do your work. Get us out of the way. I rebuke every thought that sets itself up against your knowledge, and I release peace. I release boldness. I release courage right now over your people to do what you tell us to do. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Let's respond as Ben leads. Your 
comes on the sun of heaven rose again oh trample death where is your sting the angels roar for Christ the
a substitute for the presence of God. Thank you. Thank you, Father. We thank you for your sweet presence. We thank you that you inhabit the praises of your people. We thank you that you meet with us right where we're at, that we can outrun, we can out sin, we can out anything your love for us. I thank you, Jesus, that you are more than enough. And Father, I pray right now for your church that as we take and chew on your word this week and we digest it into our souls that we are transformed by your spirit and that we look at people differently we love people differently let us be a force to be reckoned with in a world that's so desperately void of hope let us speak hope into people our neighbors the hope of your word let us accept it let us do it and let us do it for your glory. And I pray right now for outpouring of your spirit upon us, not so we can fill it here, but so we can change the world out there. And Lord, I pray that you will bless us as we go. Lord, bless us as we come. Bless us as we lay our heads down, as we rise our heads up. Bless our efforts. Bless us as we seek to glorify your name and grow your kingdom. Lord, I pray that, that our efforts to grow your kingdom will not just be in addition, but in multiplication. In your mighty name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. I love you guys. Have a great week.